Remember me, oh mighty God. Remember me, oh Lord. Remember me, oh mighty God. Remember me, dear Lord, I pray. Remember me, oh mighty Lord. Remember me, oh Lord. Remember me, oh mighty God.
Amen, church. We have just praised God and just reminded him of how great he is. For those of us who have been here for a period of time, we have a trademark for that song. And we can't just help to praise God. I think with that, we can just pray and continue singing, telling God who he is. And once again, welcome to our Sunday service. It's great to be around, to praise God. Uh, choir people, it's so great. You have really just uh, inspired us this morning. And to continue praising God, I'll read uh, from First Chronicles uh, 16, from verse 8 to 11. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among nations what he has done. Sing to him, sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory, glory in his holy name. Let the, the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful this morning that, Lord, you have considered us worthy to be into your presence this morning. We thank you for how you have taken care of us uh, since the week began. And now, God Father, it's a time for us to come together to praise you. We thank you for the many blessings that, Lord, you have put our way. Different challenges of the week, oh God, you have proven to be Lord. And that's why we have a chance to come into your presence. And I want to say thank you for each and every brother, every sister who have made it this morning to come together and sing praises to you. Lord, we continue to thank you. We thank you for the voices of your sons and daughters that, Lord, you have given the privilege to praise you, to remind us of your greatness each and every time, O oh God. Father, we want to say thank you for our children who are with us this morning. I know we have our high schoolers who have managed to come back for the half terms. It's a joy to the parents to see them. But Lord, we are also grateful that you have brought them back home safely, that God, we may together give honor and glory to your name. We commit this service before you, Father. I want to commit each and every man, woman in this congregation this morning, because it's so clear to us that you know each and every one of us by name. You know our challenges, you know our strength, you know our weaknesses, Almighty God. But in all this, your grace is sufficient for us. We pray, Almighty God, we will draw our strength from you, that, Lord, we will tell of your greatness among nations. That, Lord, we will tap our strength from you, Almighty Father. That, Lord, we look up to you each and every day of our lives, Almighty God. That everything shall pass, God, but your righteousness will remain. We pray that we may seek your greatness. We may seek your righteousness, righteousness Almighty Father. That, Lord, not, not, nothing counts but being into your presence, Almighty God. Forgive us, Father, for anything that, Lord, we have done that is not right before you. Any word we have spoken, any idea we have harbored in our thoughts, that, Lord, may block our prayers before you this morning, that may block our requests before you, Almighty Father. May you forgive us, Almighty God. Help us learn, O God, Father, to humble ourselves before you, to forgive whatever grievances that may be among us, as Almighty God. To know that we are a loving Father, and your joy is when your sons and daughters live in peace, Almighty God. We pray that Satan will not have a foothold in our lives, O oh God. He will not succeed in accusing us before you, O oh God. That, Lord, we learn to come before you with grateful and sincere to God. Give us a heart that is contrite, a heart of God, Father, that is broken, that, Lord, you are our Father. We pray this morning that, Father, may you guide us, may you lead us. I commit the minister of today and to your holy hands 
that God has ministered to us with the words, be that which is filled, that which is coming from you, Almighty for God. I want to say thank you for the rest of the activities. Be with, we be with us, Almighty Father, for I ask all this trusting and believing in such most holy name. Amen. 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 church. Good morning once again. Amen. Um, we have come to an important part of our service where we observe the Lord's Supper. This is a time when we remember uh, what Jesus went through on the cross. The pain, the suffering, the torture, and the death that he endured for your sake and my sake. So I hope that as we Go through this session, you reflect and connect with what really happened. We shall be partaking of the bread and the wine that represents the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. Please, I hope it will uh, bring back those memories and help you reconnect with Jesus in your way of life. Luke chapter 23, verse 33. Luke 23. 
verse 33. The Bible says, when they came to the place, sorry, are we there? Luke 23, 33. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right and the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by, by casting lots. My name is Albert Simiu. Uh, now, <clears throat> the skull. The Bible says they came to a place called the skull. Now, if I showed up on this podium with a skull today, this morning, a real skull, not that one used by doctors in, uh, in, uh, in the hospitals, but a real skull of a human being. I'm sure, you know, a, a, holy, com I mean, um, a holy communion session takes five minutes, but I'm sure by the time I'm done, I'll be alone in this hall. Because a skull, Calvary, as used in this verse, means skull. Or it refers to something that is skull-like. And the place where Jesus was crucified, that hill of Calvary, looks like a skull. That's why it's called the skull or Golgotha. It actually resembles a skull. So, the question I was asking myself is, why did God choose to allow Jesus to be crucified at a place like that? You know, because a skull, First of all, a skull symbolizes death. Death. Because it belongs to a dead person. It also symbolizes danger. You know, evil or harm. But that's exactly where God chose for Jesus to be crucified. I believe God wanted you and I to see the gravity of sin or the consequence of sin that Jesus was carrying on your behalf and my behalf. That indeed sin causes death. Now, Golgotha, or the place of the skull, symbolizes death. But in different ways. And it depends on the way you look at it or the way you align yourself. It symbolizes death to those who refuse to accept Jesus and die in their sin. That's one. The place of the, of the skull or Golgotha. Those who refuse to accept Jesus and die in their sins. And to, to bring your memory or recollect your recollection to the uh, scripture where it says, there was a robber on his left and the robber on his right. One of them stubbornly refused to recognize Jesus and died, ended up dying in sins. So, for him, Golgotha or uh, Calvary rep represented death in that sense. But then, it, Golgotha, I mean, the place of the skull also symbolizes those who are brokenhearted, who confess their sins at Jesus' feet and plead with him for eternal life. On the contrary, it, it, it uh, symbolizes death to the, to the sting of death. So one, it symbolizes death to those who stubbornly refuse to accept Jesus. But it also symbolizes death to the sting of death. Meaning, if you look at Calvary as the place where Jesus redeemed your life, delivered your life, 
give you a ch second chance, uh, you know, forgive you, and give you a chance to, for, for eternity, then you have killed death. And so, the question, my brothers and sisters, is what is your perspective of Calvary or the place of the skull? With whom do you align? Do you align with the robber who, who took the opportunity, who grabbed the, that very last minute chance and brought down the sting of death? And killed death and defeated death in that image of the skull? Or do you align yourself with the one who stubbornly refused and even, you know, uh, rubbed salt in, uh, in his injury by heaping insults on Jesus Christ? You know how you can rub salt in your injury and heap insults on Jesus? It's by continuing to sin today. If you continue living in sin and you know, not wanting to repent or just being complacent, not being broken hearted, just being in church but living a different lifestyle, then you are aligning yourself with that robber who was on the left of Jesus Christ. And so what is your perspective of Golgotha? So yes, in summary, Golgotha is a place of the skull symbolizing death but it depends on how you align yourself. And God gave us the two robbers to help us take sides. So today, choose which side of Jesus do you want to belong? On the robber who grabbed the opportunity and, got, and uh, over, overcame death, or the one who stubborn refused and died? It, we have the chance, brothers and sisters, today, now to make that decision. Reflect on the cross as you take the bread and the wine and make the decision now. Amen? At the same time, we shall be collecting a contribution that goes to helping those who are needy among us. Please give with a generous uh, heart as God calls upon us to do. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to reflect on the cross of your son Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Father, this morning you have given us an opportunity to choose whether to bring to death the sting of death or to rub salt in our injury by continuing to live in sin. My Lord and my God, I pray that we shall make the right choice. That every single soul in this room shall choose O oh Lord, to put to death the sting of death. And that our perspective of Golgotha will be gratitude for a place where our, our, our lives were redeemed. That our perspective of Golgotha will be a place where we are given a second chance. Our perspective of Golgotha will be a place where we were redeemed and given a chance for eternity. Thank you, Father. Give us the strength and the grace to repent. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
wonderful to be in this place today. Mimi nimesisimuka leo. Hata ninaposimama hapa nasikia joto. Eh? Vile kwaya wametutumbuiza hapa. Nyoyo zetu zimechangamka. Na nashukuru Mungu kwamba ametujenga ili tukaweze kujengana. Ni jambo la busara. I welcome you to this service. The topic is still about connection. Getting connected to Jesus. And I would like us to just reflect a little on this wonderful topic, particularly in relation to the things that happen around us. And I think you will all agree with me that we have that innate desire to love and be loved. And that is why personal relationships matter to us. We take time, we sacrifice our time and energy to keep these relationships healthy. When you have an effective way to communicate and serve, that becomes the fuel that takes your relationship from one uh, um, step to another. And this is with family, with friends, and associates. So, you see, the need for healthy relationships is very human. It's part and parcel of us. It is very normal. And it is also necessary. Amen? Long ago, a gentleman by the name Maslow 
who was studying human behavior, developed what we now today know as the hierarchy of needs. This is a theory where belonging is listed as our next need after food, safety, and shelter. Amen? But with time, things have changed. Ideologies have come. Until now, you hear about my space, my comfort. Don't get too close because you will disrupt my comfort. Have you heard of this phrase, to sizoyane? Ushawa yambiwa ibo? Hmm? To sizoy? Yani usikuje karibu sana. Na mimi nisikusonge wapi? That is human thinking. What is God's thinking? The closer you get to God, the better it becomes. It doesn't matter whether you are one inch or one centimeter closer to God. That, in fact, is the best situation. Amen? So, an effective two-way communication and service with God will fuel that relationship. Amen? My name is Alex Mumbo, and we are here to discuss that. I came here to tell you that God is a personal God. Yes? He created us for himself. And he's longing for that intimate relationship with you and me. He wants you and me to live in a sincere love relationship with him. As you can read from Matthew 22, 37 to 38. So, what are we required therefore to do? It is to spend time with him, enjoy fellowship with him, and also communicate with him in trust, always following him, listening to his instructions. And it is this that will give meaning and purpose to our lives. Remember, brethren, we are not talking about the service we offer in church. We come, we sing, we look after the kids in the kingdom kids, okay? We participate in baptism, we arrange the chairs, we do everything that is required of us in church. But there is that bit, that personal relationship with God that must be complete before we can become whole beings before him. So, what is your top priority? What is your top priority today? Let us pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, I come before your holy presence this morning, Lord. Master, thanking you for the wonderful time that you've given us to stand before you, listen to your word, and also uh, be built by it, and also be challenged, O oh God. As we go through this discussion, we pray that you will be in our midst, and that you will indwell us, O oh God, you will continue increasing us in wisdom that, Father, we may be of value to you, O Lord, and we may be of better service to you. We thank you, we bless you, for in Jesus' name we prayed and trusted. Amen. In expanding this discussion further, I would like us to maybe draw some parallels from the Bible. And maybe just begin by saying that uh, while Jesus was here on earth, 
He always had his disciples by him, with him, except when he sent them out on missions and when the priests and Romans arrested him, tortured him, and had him crucified on the cross. Our brother Albert Smeo has just narrated that story of Golgotha and how demeaning it was. Yet Christ went through all that for your sake and mine. How did Jesus invite his disciples to follow him? And we can read this from Luke 5, 1 to 11. Luke 5, 1 to 11. And I read, On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret. And he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word, I will let down the nets. Amen. Let's continue. Luke 5, 6. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. Now here, we see a conversation between Jesus and Simon. Simon, whom we know became uh, to be known as Peter. Now, Simon addresses Jesus as master. At that point, then you ask yourself, how did it happen that already Simon knew Peter? Probably we can get this from um, John, uh, John 1, 35 to 51, where again we are told of a story, or rather um, uh, events, when Jesus called his first disciples. And I will read again. Now, I think this was after John the Baptist had had an interaction with Jesus at the river and had baptized him. So the following day, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, 
Where are you staying? And he said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Amen? And he first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Then we read on uh, um, about the calling of Philip and Nathaniel, and this is how it went from verse 43. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. So Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him, we have found him, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And uh, Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, whom there is no deceit. Why did Jesus describe Nathanael as such? Probably this is a man who was so learned in the law. Probably he was so much, he was so deep in traditions that he knew there was a phrase that nothing good could come out of Nazareth. So, Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree. Do you believe you will see greater things than this? And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Amen? Here, we see that Jesus had a special message for each one of his disciples. None was like the other. Do you agree with me? When he met them for the first time, and we also, we are told that with Simon, he renamed him Peter, such that by the time Jesus was preaching from the boat, Simon already knew who he was, for he referred to him as master. On matters responding to this call that we are all called to, it is important to understand that it is personal business. Responding to this call is personal business. Jesus called you as an individual. He called you through a special message. Amen? And he gave you a specific assignment. What is your assignment today? Are you familiar with the position that God has placed you in the kingdom? How is your walk with Christ? The other thing we see is that Responding to the call has implications. 
And these implications could be either negative or positive. You could experience loss. You could experience change of occupation. It will certainly involve switching allegiance. Yes, when you become a disciple, you switch your allegiance. Because probably before you became a disciple, you had certain ways of life that you identified with. Certain traditions that kind of sustained you from day to day. That is what perhaps you described life as. But then you came to the Lord and everything changed. You became a follower of Christ. Such that now your culture is inscribed in Christ. Amen? Your culture is inscribed in Christ. Huko hapo katikati. Hakuna mguu pale ama wapi? Huko hapo katikati. Tunaelewana? So, do the songs that you sing, that you have received a change, that you have received a transformation in your life, do they make a meaning? Do they have a meaning in your life? Do they have a meaning? The things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Munaijua hiyo? Bwana atubariki. So since I was born again, there has been a transformation. There has been a great change in my life. Can I testify as such? So actually responding to the call will detach you from the world and attach you to Christ. Amen? Amen. It will degraft you from the world and graft you to Christ. Amen? That, of course, means your source of nourishment will change. You will begin eating new food and you will be, begin experiencing things anew. Amen? The other thing that we need to understand is that responding to the call requires Total dedication. Okay? We've, left, we, we've read about what the disciples experienced when they received the call or they took upon the call. They left all they had and followed him. Okay? You remember the story of Peter? They went to the sea. They caught a very huge catch of fish, yes, until their nets were, they called their partners who were somewhere on the shore spectating. They came along and did what? Assisted them to lift the nets. They filled the boats until the boats began to sink. That is Jesus. That is Jesus. And let me remind you this. Jesus, when he was asking Simon to launch in the deep or to move from the shore so that he could speak, he, that boat was empty. The boat was what? Jesus chose an empty vessel. Have you emptied yourself of all the things, the cares of this world? So that God can make use of you and me. Amen? Now see, after Simon gave up his boat for use by the Lord, there were benefits. There were benefits. Benefits that went to them as well as their companions or partners. And then what happened? They brought this fish to the shore. 
What happened to the fish? Nobody knows, isn't it? Yes? They were looking at the source. That is Jesus. Do you get blessed today? And that clouds your mind to the extent that you cannot see God beyond the blessing that you have for the day. What is your vision about Christ? How do you see God? Who is he to you? Do you see him from the perspective of the job that he has given you? Do you just see God from the perspective of the family that he has put you in? God is much more than that. And the disciples noted this. And what they did was they left everything, including the fish and the boats, and followed who? They had one mind to follow Jesus. None of them looked back. Okay? Now, brethren, there are things double that the Lord hates. And I would like us to have a discussion on this. Amen? We read from Psalms 12, 2. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor with a flattering, a flattering lips and a double heart they speak. I can assure you today that the Lord hates double hearts. Are we together? The Lord hates double hearts. The other thing is double iniquity. When people get used to sin, they sin more and more. It becomes double, triple, and name it. And this is what God is saying. He hates double iniquity. Hosea 10.10 10. When I please, I will discipline them, and nations shall be gathered against them when they are bound up for their double iniquity. Amen? There is recompense for double iniquity. Let us remember that. The other thing that the Lord hates is a double tongue. A double tongue. And this is to deacons, pastors, as well as us. First Timothy 3.8. Deacons likewise must be dignified and not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. So we can say the Lord hates a double-tongue. Who here understands what a double tongue is. Have we heard about sometimes people campaigning on the road saying, I will do this, I will do this. And after they are elected, they forget. They didn't say that. Or today you hear someone on TV standing and saying, this is wrong. And tomorrow they have changed. That's a double tongue. A double tongue. And the Lord hates that. <coughs> Let us be aware of this. The other thing the Lord hates is double mindedness. James 1 8. It says this He is a double minded man and stable in all his ways. And I think you can read you know, the, the verses that precede this, and you get to know what double-mindedness is. But today, you decide to follow the Lord. And tomorrow, maybe you are found doing something that is contrary to the calling. That is having a double mind. And the same 
um, Bible says that a double-minded person will never receive anything from the Lord. What do you expect from the Lord? So double-mindedness is a sin that God hates. You can also read from Psalm 119, 113, where he says, I hate double-minded, but I love the double-minded, but I love your law. That was a confession that the psalmist made. Okay? So, this is God's adv advice to us from James 4.8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So here we are being urged to be sober-minded, just as we read from 1 Peter 5, 8. So responding to this call will require us to acknowledge and firmly believe who Jesus is in our lives. Who is Jesus in your life? Is he just a simple pastime? Is he a hammer with which you to inflict pain upon your enemies or my enemies? Does knowing him add value to my Christian life? And for whose glory is it? From the time I became a disciple, has my life changed? And in what manner? What milestones has he helped me accomplish in my life? Am I living just to grow old, die, and meet him in heaven? Is that my goal? Is that my aspiration? What, my, what are my aspirations in life? Are they in line with those of Jesus about me. Brethren, responding to the call is the first step of obedience. First Peter 1.13 says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And also Mark 6, 7 to 13, urges us as follows. And he called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to, make, to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you, and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. Amen? They went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who are sick and healed them. Amen? So you see, the first task here was what? Urging people to repent. Repentance is the first thing. 
Then healing comes after that. Okay? The cleansing comes after that. The first step is what? So it was only after heeding the call and developing that intimate relationship with Jesus did um, Jesus actually begin sending out his disciples on evangelistic missions. Jesus had to prepare his own for the task ahead. How prepared are you? So their effectiveness in the field very much dependent on how close and personal they were with Jesus. That was the only way they could get equipped for good works. God has called us to many, many forms of service. We are called to be evangelists. A lot of times I'm challenged by brethren, particularly Brother Charles Owidi. A lot of times we meet out here and he tends to pull me. We go out there to go and evangelize. But fortunately or unfortunately, that time I'm headed somewhere to pray. Amen? Are you connected with Christ to the extent that you can have that urge to evangelize like some of our brethren in this congregation? Does it eat you to walk out there and tell someone Jesus loves you? Then there is intercession. Has it ever occurred to you that the church requires intercessors? How much do you pray for the leadership of this church? Because their success wholly depends on the prayers that you make. This church requires mentors. We have our children who are growing up and they are growing up in a world that is full of all sorts of detractions. What is your responsibility in making these children follow the right path? Are you ready to become a mentor or a coordinator in the service of Christ? Brethren, when we heed the call in all honesty, in all earnestness, you discover that there is nothing Nothing, nothing that's better than Jesus. Amen? Amen? There is nothing in this life that will, you will find more important than being with Jesus. And let me tell you this. Our souls will never experience satisfaction until we discover the joy of devotion. Just like we are told in Psalm 63.5. Then will all the possessions, power, pleasures, and prestige that this world offers become empty. And our lives be transformed completely. Brethren, the parting shot is this. No one can have an intimate relationship with God and remain the same. Amen? Amen. May God bless you as you ponder these words. Amen. Good morning, church. Wasn't that amazing? Uh, that is my calm, collected professor. And uh, he has delivered uh, that if you have a relationship with God, with Jesus, you will not remain the same. I don't know about you this morning, but to me, that one has drawn me back to ask myself, where am I with Jesus? Have I identified my role 
in the service of the Lord. Uh, one beautiful thing with uh, God is that uh, he's God of another chance. And uh, the last bit is a call to repentance. And that is what I believe uh, all of us should be broken enough and find our footing and have uh, a relationship with God. Go empty your boat so that Jesus fills his blessings. I stand here as part of those who can be counted as a people to number the blessings of God. I was converted in Kibra. I moved to Nadandora as a young boy. We were with Salome, Robert, Amboso, and here I am today. Yeah, and counting on the blessings of God, a family man. Yes, yeah, so I have to recollect myself and find my footing and have a relationship with God. Because that is the promise from what the professor has just shared with us. None get into a relationship with God and walk empty-handed. There is something that God has given you that we must uphold and uh, run with. Thank you so much, Professor. And uh, for that reason, let's just give a round of an applause for what our professor has done. Yeah, uh, thank you so much also the song leaders. I was so much tempted to take a lot of time praying just to uh, paraphrase the, the singing. Uh, my conversion was uh, when the songs were done. I was just uh, a wandering boy, but was empty and yearning to get a place where I can worship. I studied in the village, so when I came to Nairobi, one thing I heard was that Nairobi is a capital city of churches. And I was praying that God lead me to a church where you are being worshipped. And one of the songs, uh, the most excellent, was done by Richard Alawai. And it happened that every Sunday when I was passing to meet my family members, that, could, that song could be done. It was done the second time, of the first time, second time, the third time I said, no, I'm not going to where I'm heading to, let me branch here. That was Nyayo Stadium. And from there, I never turned back. I met friends. They studied the Bible with me, and I became a disciple. Yeah, the call uh, the professor has made is uh, to make disciples of all nations. The call to just share what you have. The first call, they never stopped there. They went ahead and identified a friend to call a friend. May that spirit be with us and take it higher because it has not ended. The kingdom of God will advance in a forceful way. Thank you, Brother Albert, for leading us, our thoughts to the cross. And he left us with two questions. Is death on the cross a sting or a punishment to, the, to death? Or is it salvation that Jesus Christ died for our sins? So that is what we need to take home. And it's running parallel to what uh, my brother Alex has just shared with us, that having a rest with us must make a difference in our lives. And that's the difference to live and uh, to appreciate what God has done in our lives. For that, let's appreciate all the services that we have had this morning. This is a great day today. Eh? Uh, before you is a young man who goes by the name of Prince Michael Jr. Wambuere. And uh, this is the day.
that he has decided to, you know, make Jesus Christ the Lord of his life. But we want to hear it from the horse's mouth, right? So, Prince, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He died, and on the third day he resurrected for the forgiveness of your sins. Yes, I do. Amen. What is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. Because of your good confession, we will baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit so that you may receive the forgiveness of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Let us proceed. decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow him. I have decided Please let's put our hands together to as we welcome Jesus. the new kid on the block. anything and so I, was, I just kept checking are we okay here are we okay uh, of course i'm so excited prince um that today you're making a very important decision uh we've talked and uh clearly i mean this is a serious decision you're making uh, you have to really uh, how your project is right going forward uh, but personally i'm just so excited i know that uh, the decision you're making is a very important decision a very good decision at this moment in your time and i pray that, uh, even as you begin this journey, that uh, you know God will walk with you, and don't forget that uh, your mom and I we're here, and uh, we will walk this journey with you. We will support you, and uh, yeah. So uh, please feel free uh, to you know to uh, get us involved in whichever way, because our support is unwavering. And we are so happy that you actually are making the decision, and I pray that uh, you continue to be a great example. For your siblings and even for others as well. Uh, I know you're one a very uh, talented person. I know you're one very focused guy. Uh, you're a very passionate guy. And I know that uh, when you set your mind to do something, you go for it. And so I believe and pray that uh, even as you make the decision to follow Jesus, that is just going to make a mark in your life. Make, make you to become an even better person. Become a better version of you in, in this life. 
So I thank God so much for just what uh, you know you're doing today. I'm so grateful to all the brothers who stepped in there you know, just to guide you through and your friends who also inspired you. I am just so grateful for everything. Today I'm just so happy. May the Lord be with you in this journey. But I know your mom also wants to say something. So. Today is um, a very emotional day. I think as the angels celebrate in heaven, uh, for me, I rejoice. I think uh, Prince being my firstborn, it's been a journey. And for mothers in the house, I think you can relate a little bit. Um, I would say first that uh, we should be careful when we name our children. I think uh, having him be named after me and the dad, there are a lot of similar character. I think we should choose one. Maybe if you choose you, <laughs> yeah, because then we have the both, you know, coming, uh, we experience it, it's not easy. Uh, but I also just wanted to say, uh, I know we normally say it takes a village to raise a child, uh, but I say it takes a spiritual family, a spiritual village uh, to be able to lead a child to Christ. Uh, this journey, I, we can't take any credit because it's been completely team, teamwork. Uh, specifically, I say that I know for myself, I feel like God has planned this journey because today, um, exactly the same man, uh, 34 years ago, the same age as he is, I also made the same decision to make Jesus Lord of my life. And so for me, I see God working, uh, but specifically he worked through so many um, uh, brothers, and uh, I would not, not say, you know, my appreciation. I want to start first with uh, uh, Valentine Mayula, and not, I'm not sure if he's here, and Ken Matara. When Prince was very young, he, along with his brother, they would go over for sleepover. So the journey started from there, in which you know, the desire, Mama, can we go and spend time? And that sleepover was not just fun, but also they had the opportunity to look at scriptures. Uh, from that, it continues with uh, the mentorship in church. Tony, I'm not sure where Tony is, but my son now only inspired, you know, to be like Tony because I believe it's not just what Tony preached in terms of message, but a lifestyle as well. His uncle, Seringo, who is somewhere here, who has joined him with Prince uh, from a very early age. Um, he would come home uh, just to see how they were doing. And when he's unable to come home, he would call, you know, just to check in. Um, and I feel it made it easy when Prince decided to make Seringo be the one who were joining with him. You know, I know he's in college now. When he's coming after college, just in the afternoon, I would say, you're not eating anything. He said, no, I'm going to study with Uncle Seringo. And he would say, I know Uncle Seringo will make sure I have food to eat. And indeed, that will happen. You know, thank you so much, uh, Seringo. I can't thank you. I can't thank you enough. I said thanks to Evangelist Mike, I'm not sure. Um, you know, he will probably hear this, but he initiated. I want to encourage parents in the house. Sometimes we want to see the transformation in our children first before allowing them to look at the scripture. I can tell you, let the scripture transform our children. Yes. And I thank God for, you know, uh, Evangelist Mike and the initiation. And not only just him, you know, I had uh, other our led uh, evangelist Sami who initiated our time to spend with him, uh, Pastor Charles who's um, not here but hopefully he will hear that as well. You know, so it's been a journey. It's been a journey for Prince. We have um, uh, family friends. We call them the new new Mr. Uh, he just yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, Newton. In Newton, I think he never got tired of me because when my husband is not around, I call Newton. Newton, you need to check on your nephew. This is what is happening. Morrison, I'm not sure where Morrison is. Yeah, Morrison, the second one. And God used all these uh, us amazing brothers just to be able to impact him. I know the list is endless. There are many of you 
who impacted him in different ways, even through your press. I just want to say thank you so much. Lastly, I just want to encourage my son. I know my husband has said it all. I know he's a very bright, focused young man, like my husband said. But I want you, as you make this, this decision you have made, to always make Jesus your reference. You know, make sure you ask yourself, what will Jesus do in every situation, in every day of your life? What will Jesus do? Let him be that example for you. We have many mentors, you have the evangelists, you have messages, but let Jesus always be your focus. I love you, I'm happy, I'm here, you know me. Me and you, eh, I won't say more. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Let's go ahead and stand. We can say our final prayer as the choir makes its way up here. <clears throat> uh, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you this afternoon, Lord, with our hearts full of joy and thanksgiving, Father, to see a young soul make Jesus the Lord of his life, almighty God. We thank you for Prince we thank you for the bold decision as a young man that he has made to make you the Lord of his life, almighty God. And Father, just like we've heard in today's message about the call, how I pray that indeed for Prince and indeed all of us, we shall take this call seriously, almighty God, that we shall always remember your great love for us, O Heavenly Father, that Lord, we may also remember those who are out there who need to also hear this call. Please be with Prince, O Heavenly Father, as he steps out into this world, Almighty God, even as he goes on into college. Father, may you be a shield around him. May you protect him, Father. I pray that he will be of great influence and impact to the young men and women that he shall encounter along the way, Almighty God. That, Father, they'll be able to see Christ in him, O Heavenly Father. Mighty God, thank you for the brothers and sisters who've been around him, almighty God, to encourage and to inspire him, almighty King. I pray that even as we look out to reach out to many more of our sons and daughters, that, Father, they will feel the love. They will see the need to make Jesus Lord over their lives, Father. Father in heaven, as we get out there, as we embark on this new week, may you walk with us, Father. May you guide and direct our steps, almighty God. May you help us to always remember and set you as Jesus, as Lord, as Master of our lives. We thank you, we love you, and we adore you. We ask and we pray this in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.